Welcome to the Halftime Report, everybody. I am Brian Sullivan, in for Scott Wapner today. Boy, he picked a good day to be off. All right, front and center this hour, the sell-off getting worse. Really, it's after a bad jobs number, more lower jobs revisions from previous months, increased fears of recession. Oh, and Amazon and Intel posting huge losses as well. Their stocks, anyway. All this as fear rises. One of the biggest jumps in the VIX that we have ever seen. Needless to say, it is a nervous time, but don't worry. We've got the perfect crew for you to handle it all. Joining us for the hour is Bryn Toggenden, Jim Labenthal, Jason Snipe, and Rob C. Chan, all on set. Thank you, everybody, for schlepping down here on this beautiful fall day. Anyway, let's get to them in moments. Here's how your money and the markets look right now. And if you don't like the color red, I would advise you to turn away. We've got the Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500 all down right around 2%. The Dow Industrials tumbling more than 800 points, as that big red banner there says on your TV screen as well. Small caps taking it on the chin. Banks getting hit as well. There is a lot to discuss, so I'm just going to shut up and we're going to jump right into this. Jim, I'm going to start with you because the VIX is up 54%, which makes no sense to me. Maybe you can get into that. There's a lot of fear out there. Is this an overreaction? Yes. Let's thank let's, you, and that's your show for today. Yeah. Okay. Um, final trade is. Yeah. Uh, no. Short look, fix. And, and look, I, look, I'm generally optimistic when I'm on the show. People know that, and I don't want to be accused of being blasé or, or missing what's going on. But look, the jobs report. You want to look at the unemployment rate and freak out about it? That's fine. You have to note that the response rate to the household survey has been going down for years. There's questions about its accuracy. The institutional report or the institutional survey still shows job growth. You know. You look at weekly jobless claims. Yes, they've popped up, but they're at an extraordinarily low level. You've got GDP growth. You've got profit growth. Calm down, okay? Now, when a correction happens, which is what I think we're in, and we can debate it, okay, but when a correction happens, it always feels like it's something worse. 100% of the time, it feels like it's going to be a bear market. There's always a reason for it. This time, Brian, it's the kind of lousy spate of economic data that we've had. Yeah. This is what a correction looks like. When you've got profit growth, when you've got GDP growth continuing, when you've still got job growth going on, it's hard to get really bearish. Yeah, Rob, you made an excellent point. You came up, you said hello, by the way, and very nice to see you. You nice talked about you positioning and that the positioning of a lot of the big money on Wall Street, maybe hedge funds, Delta One strategies, whatever you want to call it, was so far on one side that it's probably exacerbating the violence of the move the other way. Could, in plain English, explain what you were talking about. Yes. Well, in early July, you had valuations, positioning and sentiment very lopsided, moving into a seasonally week period. You had some economic prints today included that obviously scared some. And the question is, is this an un unwelcomed cooling or an unwelcome slowdown? And the bond market is really what I think is driving this. Uh, is this break in yields by the bond market sniffing out something that everybody else is not? And I think it's too early to, to assume that. I think we're no doubt seeing a slowing. It is a deceleration, but it's not collapsing. Um, when you look at our original call, we showed no recession in 24. We expected there was a greater risk of that in 25. Now, that might have been pulled forward, and those probabilities might have gone up. The, the risk that I see out there is, does this cause everybody to take which was, was driving these markets all year, which was accelerating GDP growth and expectations and accelerating earnings and expectations and recalibrate them down a little bit? The beauty of that is it sets 25 up for something that's easier. So today's pain might be tomorrow's uh, gain, mm -hmm. so to speak, in that you can recalibrate these things. Now, let's talk about some technicals, too. There was a, there's been a massive unwind under, underway. And if you want me to put on my doom and gloomer hat, the most crowded trade on the planet was short yen long tech, period. It is rapid. That, that was consensus. It yeah. is rapidly unwinding. And are we caught in this consensus vortex for a period of time? 
right? Who, I, let's, let's talk about I would say this. Okay, Doomer. Right? Isn't that a, like a thing people say? Well, I'm internet? not saying that no, that's the camp no, we're no, in. But I'm saying, it, listen, I don't know how many of our viewers and listeners are shorting the Japanese yen right. and buy, but, but on, on up the road here and around the corner yes. at some of these hedge funds up near you in Connecticut, they are. Bryn, Tom Lee yeah. putting out a note saying a VIX up this much mm-hmm. to him smells like panic. Panic can often mean opportunity. Absolutely, and I think that we were just talking, the market collectively was just talking about a week ago that the Fed doesn't need to be in a hurry because although the economy, unemployment specifically, is moving higher, and obviously we don't want that trend to continue, everyone was like, the Fed has plenty of time to cut, no problem. And then all of a sudden, it's like everyone's pivoted, and now you're seeing the probability of a 50 basis point a rate cut in September has doubled in just the past few days. And so I definitely think we have a jittery market. I think also on Rob's point about the yen, I don't traffic in this at all. But, you know, individual investors, we as investors are not trafficking in the yen. But hedge funds lever that. They borrow yen, lever it up, and then they go buy what? They buy tech. They buy what's moving. And I think you're seeing the mechanics under the market, a massive unwind of that trade. But it's like nothing's changed in the economy except we've had a slight tick up in unemployment. And as, as Ten I of think, the last 14 jobs numbers have been revised down. Right. And so that's why unemployment I mean, it's not just about higher. July because yeah. you're from Texas. You got hit with Hurricane Barrel, that yep. storm messing with the numbers. Yep. But if, to Jim's earlier point, if it was just one month. But yep. I, I wonder how much we even need to honestly trust that jobs number anymore. Well, right? that, I mean, I, and, and it was yeah, still positive. Jason, jump in here. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think for me. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. I look at the GDP print, which we just had a couple weeks ago, which is 2.8%. It's like that was three years ago, right? So the, the economy is still chugging along. I think when I look at the consumer and analyze the consumer, I think it's more of a normalization than a, this oblit, o, obliterate slowdown. Um, you know, so for me, as, as I look at these prints that we saw yesterday, ISM, obviously the job numbers this morning, um, you know, and then we saw this rotation trade a couple weeks ago, which has obviously stalled since then. Um, I also look at it to Rod's point. I think it's, I think there's an opportunity here in the market, right? We've, we, we've been top heavy all year. You know, it's been the AI trade all year. We saw a little bit of a rotation. Now we're seeing a little bit of a pullback through us, through seasonality that this is what, this is what the season is becomes, um, I think there's opportunities that kind of, from a positioning standpoint, looking at growth in other places in the market. And we're, and we're still in an uptrend. Yeah. 64% of the names in the S&P 500 are still above their 50-day moving average. Right. Right? So that is technically, we, we are in an uptrend. So if you don't get a breakdown in growth, if you don't get a breakdown in earnings expectations, you should be buying this dip. It's a question of where. Mm-hmm. Okay, because we are in a slight vortex right now where markets will recalibrate to this, and investors have to be positioned at the ready to do something. Yeah. Right. Well, NVIDIA's, listen, let's be, let's be a little positive. It's Friday, mm-hmm. right? I know the markets are down, okay? Markets go down, they go up. NVIDIA's down 2%. Apple is actually higher. Tesla's down about 3%. You've got some disasters out there. We'll get to more on Intel later, maybe a little bit more on Amazon as well. But it feels like, to Rob's point, Bryn, this was just this massive, rapid unwind of certain positions that 99% of our viewers and listeners at home are not doing. Right. This was an institutional move. Correct. And then what you don't want is then you don't want retail to follow, right? Because that's where, does this move then end up having legs? And I think that right now we have an unwind of things that were happening, as we talked about earlier, mechanically. Look, NVIDIA is still up, what, 113% just for the year. And so did it really make a ton of sense that it went from 100 to a 130 in like a week, which was what, a trillion dollars in market cap? Is that, is, that, is that normal? Did something change in NVIDIA to make it go to a trillion dollars? No, and so I think you yeah. see a normalization of that. Okay, okay, now let me, let me hold on, Jim. Uh, they want me to move on to Amazon, which I agree. So I'm going to flip it a little bit. We tried to have a little op- optimism to kick off the show. but I can look at that. A, a, yeah, why not, right? Let's to, do it. To, Amazon, to Rob's right? point. Yeah, but, but Amazon today, that, to me, I know everybody, you know, all due respect to everybody else out there is saying it's a Fed-related move, and maybe it is. But I wonder how much Amazon is playing into the whole thing as well, because their numbers, web services was great. Yeah. But the consumer yeah. side, I think the technical term is stunk. 
Yeah, and, and the guidance wasn't terrific. Now, I own the stock. Yeah. It's a recent position for me. I'm, I'm basically flat on where I bought it. I'm not looking at this and saying, oh, my God, what did I get myself into? Yeah. This is Amazon, okay? Whatever. Let's just say for a second that my opening soliloquy was wrong and we're going into a recession and the consumer mm -hmm. is going to fall out of bed. Do we yeah. really think that on the other side of that, Amazon isn't going to gain market share in right. everything it's doing and thrive? Right. Um, I would be buying this today if I hadn't already built a large position, and I think this is absolutely a great entry point. This is where I was buying it uh, in February. Uh, look, it's it's a sl it's a miss on the guidance. We got that. The stock's down eight percent, and that's your buying opportunity. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, my wife's Go consumer on. products exec, Jim Cramer, said it this morning on Squawk on the Street. Yeah. My wife will tell you this straight up. Amazon is killing CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, Dwayne Reed, and others. But you, right? you can so they're win on the consumer side. They're going to win on that on that side. But let me ask it even this: a little more of a hot take, sports style, Rob. <laughs> Do we care about Amazon's consumer business? They sell more shampoo. I, I, I think mm -hmm. you care about this in that earnings report. This is the Jerry Maguire moment for tech. It's the show me the money moment in monetization of AI. And what Amazon told you, and I think what was disappointing in this report, is they're going to have to spend a heck of a lot more and it's going to take a lot longer to monetize that. We don't own it, but there's going to be haves and have nots. And obviously, NVIDIA is a current beneficiary. It's a significant beneficiary. And we are not, we don't own it, we are not why don't you, not saying. Why don't, why don't you, you hold on? We are not not saying that this is Cisco in the late nineties. Okay. We are not not thing. saying. You just that. quoted. That's my tweet from yeah. two nights ago. You saw that before I got stung in the face with Hornets last night. You saw that. That I was not not saying it. Right. Excellent pickup. Two points. Can I can I can I jump yeah. on Amazon? I'm is winning that, the game. Is that, is that, is that, <laughs> I don't know I think, what you just said. Yeah, I think, <laughs> tweet yeah. later. Yeah, exactly. This is like, this is like the said, presidential I'm not, not saying it, but I'm not not right. saying it. I'm right. trying to warn people about Nvidia, but that's not my job, so I I'm have to like saying it. So, so I think it. as it relates to Rob's point on the AI spend, you're already actually seeing companies monetize it, and especially Amazon and Facebook are gonna see that in ad spend. Cause that's the really good way on, on a meta to have the creator economy be able to be more sticky. And I think as it relates to Amazon, if you look at like the individual investor or the individual retail investor, fine. But look at this, their operating cash flow was up 75% up 108 billion and their free cash flow yield. So saying they're not making any money, free cash flow was 8 billion last year. It was 53 billion. This is a cash machine. And so I think to, to Jim's point, I think this this is where this is an interesting name to actually get into. I think the market's totally misreading their numbers. And, and, and just it's a bad take, bad day. And I think the retail numbers don't matter for Amazon. I agree 100%, I, when I, as, especially as it relates to the operational margins. I mean, they've been growing like crazy under, ja, under Jassy. Um, and listen, to your point, Brian, AWS is the, is the part of the business that we all should care about. The, the margins are 35% on AWS, right? And that was the one that we saw a re-acceleration, right? So the e-commerce business, yes, slight miss. The ad business, slight miss. Slight miss on the top line. But they're, I mean, the EPS growth is still trending um, higher. So I think this is an, actually an opportunity more than anything else. Is it hard to get a read, Jason, on the consumer? And I'll because for every stock that falls, and there's, I'm looking at them right now, a bunch of retailers, restaurants have collapsed. I could flip that and show you a stock that has done well. I cannot, for the life of me, figure out what is going on with the consumer. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm sure you're, you're here to talk about a little bit about Apple, right? Apple, Apple's- um, Which is up today. Which is up today. Um, you know, revenue beat on the top and the bottom line. Revenue and EPS are up around close to 5%. Um, China was down a little below, little, little below 5%. Um, this is a safe haven stock, I think, in a, in a mm -hmm. tape like this. Um, it's, Apple has played this position before. This is not new to them. Um, you know, and I think the services businesses, they had a record quarter, you know, for services. And again, you know, when I think about the buyback, listen, that, that will continue to grow over time. They have a ton of free cash flow. Um, and then we, we obviously have the new story with Apple intelligence and what's going to go into the phones, which will be two quarters from now, which we'll kind of see what the results were on the iPhone 6. Laura Martin of Needham, who was on in the previous hour and one of my favorites out there, put out a note today, Jim, and just said Apple's a good place to hide. And I think to Jason's point, are you selling NVIDIA and you're selling Intel and you're selling it, not you, but people selling those stocks and just 
parking it in Apple today. I, I can live with that assessment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw just a little bit of cold water on this, just a little bit, okay? Earlier this week, we got reports from Qualcomm, Corvo, and Skyworks, three companies that provide the yep. innards to yep. the iPhones, okay? And frankly, you know, Qualcomm's report, they were pretty dour on what the rest of the year is going to be as far as iPhone sales or smartphones mm -hmm. in general go. Um, Corvo and Skyworks were okay. They were okay. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because I think with the rally that you've seen in Apple since the Worldwide Developer Conference. There is one heck of an upgrade cycle that's built in at this point in time. I think you're going to get a good upgrade cycle in the back half of this year as the holiday season approaches, but I just worry that maybe Apple's priced in a touch yep. too much. Let me be clear. I am not saying go sell your Apple. That's we not what I'm saying. I own it. I'm just saying, hey, maybe there's another side to the story. Completely agree, because Apple's become a show-me story. We're neutral in the name. We own the name, but we're neutral. And the reality of it is you've heard they're going to roll out for this upgrade cycle AI in a staged fashion. So I don't know if you're going to get that level of adoption if you're an incrementalist with your product in bringing it mm -hmm. to market. I think you could see massive changes, massive adoption, if, in fact, you did something substantial. So I think that exists. Yep. On the consumer, which you talked about a second ago, completely bifurcated. The low-end consumer really struggling, the high-end consumer doing well. Apple's got a lot of high-end consumers with $1,000 Phones. And that's always been the case. The high end will spend. I was at a boat and RV dealership last week in Wisconsin. I walk in and they're like, we haven't sold anything in months. I mean, mm -hmm. different story, but but just getting these little anecdotal pieces. We have to. All right, welcome back. It is time now for your call of the day. Wells Fargo downgrading Morgan Stanley to underweight, which, as we know, Jim is the Wall Street speak for sell yeah. ish. This is Mike Mayo. It's yeah. a lot of attention. Your but, take on the call? So, so we know Mike Mayo, he's a friend of the show, he's a very dynamic analyst, he always says what he thinks. When you see an underweight or a sell or whatever, you often think there's something wrong with the company. That's not what's going on here. I mean, I've read his note, and I don't think any of us are looking around at Morgan Stanley and seeing there's some flaw there. That's not what this note is. This note is simply saying that the re-rating in the multiple on the back of a lot of things that are coming to fruition has run its course. Now, I do think that Mike could have taken it to a neutral or something like that, because that's what generally the analyst community does when they feel like, hey, it's just ahead of its skis a little bit. But it's Mike Mayo. He doesn't pull any punches. So I get it. But I just want to make clear, this isn't like go out and short Morgan Stanley. That's not the idea here. Just underweight, right? We always call Morgan yeah. Stanley a bank. Is it, Rob? I, 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 don't, management I, I, know, I don't like, I don't like the term bank is overused. Bank, it's right. not like I'm going into Morgan Stanley and right. putting a deposit down and getting a toaster. Right. I mean, this is a different type of company, right. to your point. Yeah, I think also you have, 15 years ago, you had so many different wirehouses. You had so much, you've had such big consolidation. And I think if he's calling it for evaluation, I mean, really it comes down to it's J.P. Morgan, has is up what like 85 percent over the past five years I think morgan stanley is about 50. so it still is like jp morgan if you're going to own one bank has been the one that's treated investors the best and then there's somewhat everybody else from i'm saying not from a fundamental but from a stock perspective jp morgan continues to be i think the one that people want to own but but let's look at the why here we don't own morgan stanley we own jeffries and as much as we want rich handler to be right about the IPO market being open. He, he, he was talking about that a couple weeks ago. Market activity and growth fears like we're seeing today mm -hmm. do not help that right. in the short term. And yet, I think this is very interesting, most of the financials remain above their 50-day moving average, which means they are still technically in an uptrend, which is one of the reasons that's surprising us that this is this is not kind of spilled over into something more broad, and it is healthy. I mean, I think there's, you know, when you think about people that need to get money to work, they're on, they, they just sold a business, they're on the sidelines, they're moving in. You use volatility like this to take advantage and get money to work in areas that are attractive, so... You know, but but again, to my earlier point, there we go. You look at the KRE. It's almost like they read my mind, or at least my, my emails this morning. The KRE, the regional bank index, down 3.5%. Don't want to make too much of it. It's up 8% over a month. But there's a very big difference, Jason, between, and I'll just, you know, you're a Philly guy. There's yeah. a big difference between a PNC yeah. and a Morgan Stanley. 100%. And they're not even 100%, the same, right. not even, but we call them both 
banks. Yeah, yeah. And for me, you know, we don't have exposure to Morgan Stanley, but you know, as I look at financials, as private equity and investment banking are the areas that are of interest to us. So we own Goldman Sachs, we own Apollo, um, we own BlackRock, asset manager, right? So um, as I look at interest rates and obviously what's going on there, I think about loan demand. I think about that increasing uh, potentially. I think about credit quality, which has been reasonably well done well um, over the last couple of quarters. So I'm not terribly concerned about that. Um, and I do think when I think about IB and I think about 2025. I think, listen, I think underwriting capital markets activity has bottomed. I think we will start to see an upswing coming into 2025. Does so that benefit a Goldman Sachs? Absolutely, it benefits a Goldman Sachs and it benefits a lot of the players in that space. It benefits private equity as well. As I mean, we Goldman's start- down, Goldman is down 5% right now, Jason. It is, it so is. But somebody still- on the street is like, oh, it's not going to benefit Goldman Sachs, right? Right, right. And I mean, that's that's markets sell off story, right? But, it's but still and up to be 20- fair, everything is selling off. Today. Right, but it's still up 24% year to date, yeah. right? So I think... I think the story is still very much intact. The the Fed will cut rates in September, and I think some financials, especially as idiosyncratic yeah. stories, will catch a run. Well, you know, it's a good opportunity to, to tease my good friend Leslie Picker because on Monday, she's going home to Kansas City, shout out to Lee Wood, you know who you are, and interviewing Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon's got that bus tour. I think it's the 14th annual bus tour. Leslie will be speaking with Jamie. Probably have a promo graphic for it. Q promo graphic. Uh, and it'd be really interesting to hear what Jamie Dimon has to say about the consumer and bank. Oh, it's Wednesday. Thank you. I got right, the R off the lows, down less than 2% right now, but still, rough day if you own stocks. Anyway, welcome back to the Halftime Report. Happy Friday. I am not Scott. I am Brian Sullivan. So since I'm here, we're going to talk about energy. Why not? We're going to start with ExxonMobil, biggest oil and gas company in America. They beat on their earnings. Stock not responding, but a lot of stocks are down today. Company reporting record production, driven mostly by the acquisition of Pioneer Natural Resources. Jim, you own Exxon. Today, let's cast aside. Everything's kind of down. Your take on the quarter and outlook. Yeah, and it actually was up a little bit, but this is a solid performer quarter in and quarter out. I mean, we go back maybe 10, 9, 8 years ago. You'll remember this. Uh, when when oil prices were tanking after Saudi Arabia just flooded the market, and these were not the stocks that you wanted to own. And a lot of people said they're never going to come back. What I and others... We're going to phase been, it out. We're going to phase out oh, there's, oil. There's that, too. I, yeah. Well, let me move on from that, though. You know, over the last three years, I and others have realized that, wait a second, it's not getting phased out. These things are cash flow juggernauts. Uh, ExxonMobil in the first six months of the year has generated $17 billion of free cash flow. Yes, they made that acquisition, but at the same time, they're buying back shares, returning capital, nice dividend yield of 3.3%. And I want you to consider this as a final sort of gravy on top. Natural gas prices are still depressed. And at some point, as the global economy continues to recover from these uh, rate hikes that the whole world has seen for several years, you're going to see natural gas uh, demand and and prices increase. That's nowhere near price. Well, demand is here. already, that was my segment yesterday at Squawk Box, natural gas demand use for power production has never, ever been higher because they're feasting on the cheap nat gas. You just wonder, 13.3 million barrels a day, though, Jim, will natural gas prices go up because we're producing so much natural gas. But as you know... All being exported out near where Bryn lives. Well, that's what mm-hmm. that's what the story is. That's really what the game is, is to get that LNG to Europe, which doesn't want to buy Russian natural gas, as you well Still know. Still buying a and lot, by Asia. the way, just LNG. Yeah, that's, a, but, that's a different story. But buying LNG, and Russian Asia. LNG. Yeah. LNG Bryn? exports. That's, yeah. No, I mean, I, I live in this space. So Literally. to talk my book a little bit, but I think to Jim's point, these C-suite executives have caught religion about what's important to shareholders. Free cash flow, free cash flow, capital discipline, pay down debt. And I think you're going to continue to see that. Obviously, we have Diamondback and Devin coming out, both stocks that I own. I mean, I think Diamondback's one of the best operators in the space. We're looking for 14 and 22 percent revenue and earnings growth, respectively. And the stock's still up 20 plus percent for the year. Devin on the other side has not done well this year, but I think this is a space that you can comfortably be here, get a, a decent capital appreciation with strong dividends and the special distribution. And, and as the well. people I talk to, they, when I say who's the best operator in oil and gas, they, they used to mention Scott Sheffield. He's retiring yeah. now because he got bought. They mentioned Darren, they mentioned Mike Worth, and they mentioned Travis Stice yeah. of Diamondback, the original Fang. Any play in energy for you, Rob? Yeah, we own EOG Sun. Also a Jeff. top operator, by the yeah. way. Very quiet sure. company. EOG, I'd love to talk to you at some point, ever. 
Um, I told you about 100 we, times. There, there's a lot of types of investors in energy. There's the fundamentalists that love the cash flow story, like Bryn, and then there's those that are hedging against an Arthur Burns uh, reflation reflation moment. And I think those people have been shaken out in the last month. I mean, they may have been the canary in the coal mine in sniffing out these growth beers. And so we own it. We're underweight energy, but we're with, we think, the highest quality operators in the space. And, uh, you know, we're going to keep owning By the them. way, just r random, but if, you know what else is up today? Speaking of canaries, price of coal. Coal is actually the one mm -hmm. thing that's up today. Don't ask me why. No or care. Coming up, what second quarter earnings are telling investors and maybe should be telling you about the rest of the year? Bob Fasani is following that action, and he says it's complicated. Bob will explain right after this. All right, we are back on halftime, and Bob Fasani joining us now with a take on what second quarter earnings maybe are telling us about the rest of the year. Is there any signal through the noise, Bob? Yeah, but it's really complicated, Brian. It's very good to see you, by the way. 70% of the S&P 500 has been reported earnings so far. The earnings picture, I, again, I'm sticking with unusually complicated. So here's what's going on. First, it's been a fair, not great quarter so far. 79% are beating earnings ex expectations. That's about average. But the average beat is below 4%. That's a lot smaller than usual. And only 47% are beating on the revenue forecast. That's a lower percentage than normal for revenue, and it suggests there's some pricing pressure out there. Uh, number two, the companies are not making very bold calls on the second half at all. Most companies are beating on earnings estimates, but they're declining to hike the full year guidance beyond the earnings beat. So it's a sign that companies are taking a wait and see approach here. Third, tech earnings are still growing, but they are decelerating. We talked about NVIDIA a month ago. Uh, other companies are seeing this. There have been an elevated number of tech misses this season as well. Skyworks, for example, Juniper, Oracle, just uh, three of several. More importantly, for big cap tech, earnings growth, as I mentioned, decelerating from the huge gains seen in the past uh, two years. Fourth, a more cautious consumer has reduced many companies' pricing power. So companies like Procter & Gamble, for example, they've been hit by a real double whammy. Price hikes are slowing and demand has been tepid. Finally, there's plenty of complaints about a slowing China consumer. Again, Procter & Gamble's China sales were down 8% from a year ago's consumer spending slowed. So that's a big issue. So what's the risk to earnings in the second half of the year? The biggest risk right now is what we're seeing today. It's the growth slowdown risk. So if we are transitioning from a soft landing to a less soft landing, that means valuations become an issue, and that could be a big, big issue for tech. I will say this, though, uh, Brian, the market sniffed this out a long time ago. The high for NVIDIA was in June. It's 25% off its high. It's only down 2% today, but it's 25% off its high. A, a month ago, NVIDIA was 47 times forward earnings. Today, it's 36, 37 times. There's a significant re-rating that has occurred in the tech space already prior to what we're seeing today. And Brian, I'm not sure about that small cap rally keep going. Remember, if there's a slowdown in the economy, eh, that's a tough one for small caps right now. Well, and the market's acting like that today. Great. I had no idea NVIDIA was down that much off its intraday high, but that's what 25. you do. Bob Pisani, best in the business. Mid, Bob, thank you. Mid-June. Appreciate it. That was the high. All right. Have a great weekend. All right. Up next, the setup. The committee is ready with some trades on some of their key stocks reporting earnings next week. We've got more on that. NASDAQ's down 2.5% right now. Don't go anywhere. Back All right, up. welcome back. Before we wrap up, let's get the setup on key earnings next week, beginning with a, a big one. Berkshire Hathaway reporting tomorrow. I, Jim, you own it. I don't even know how you read into Berkshire Hathaway. they got so many businesses. Well, I, How's I, C's I, Candy doing? Exactly. <laughs> well, here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to pay attention to the <laughs> stock portfolio. I really don't care why he's selling Bank of America. That's not interesting. But the, the operating businesses give you insight into the economy. How's Burlington Northern doing? Forget C's Candy. You know, how's Precision Cast Parts doing? Geico. That's it. Well, yeah, but precision cast parts, very important part of the aerospace supply chain, uh, which has tentacles throughout the entire economy. So it's more of an economic indicator than a company-specific uh, movement. Tuesday, Uber, Jason, you own. Yeah, so f for me, I think that there's been some momentum obviously lost in the stock over the last few months. Um, you know, they need to continue to focus on profitability. Gross bookings were up 20% 20, 20 in the last quarter. Mobility was up 25%. We need to see continue following. All right, time for final trade. 50 seconds. Rob, kick it off. Uh, McDonald's, consumer stables has been sneakily outperforming, should continue. 
Jason? Microsoft demand is really strong. It's been a capacity issue. Hmm. Okay, Jim. Transocean, I know you know this space, all right? They've got 11 cold stacked rigs that have been kind of mothballed for several years. On the earnings call, they made it clear those are going to be in play and soon. That's the bull case. That's the catalyst when those mothballed rigs come back into play. That's my next band name, cold stacked rigs. Uh, Bryn, final <laughs> trade? A uh, huge call <laughs> premium in NVIDIA. You can buy NVIDIA at 105, sell the October um, 120s at $8. This is an options action. It is today. It is today. <laughs> I like it. Folks, thanks for watching Halftime Reports. A big market day. Try to keep it a little light for you. I will see you on Closing Bell. I'm Scott Wapner today. The Exchange starts right now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Blue Cloud Trading. My name is George. It is Friday, August 2nd. It was another, another bad day in the markets today. Let me just show you what happened, uh, and then we'll get into the stocks in a few moments. The Dow was down 1.51%. NASDAQ down 2.43. S&P 500 down 1.84. Russell 2000 extended its losses down to 3.54. I do want to want you guys to notice something very distinct, though, about what you're seeing right here as far as what occurred on these charts. The price from the prior day's close, it dropped, okay, for the Dow. And you'll notice that it came down and then it it, it flattened out here. So some buying started taking place throughout the day, starting at around 11 a.m., okay? And the price from that low did, in fact, increase in the NASDAQ, S&P 500, and the Russell 2000, okay? After that big gap down. Um, because when overnight trading is happening, that's what you can wake up in the morning and it's dropped down 3.54%. Not a whole lot we can do about that. Uh, let's look at the one-day performance for the S&P 500. You'll notice, um, once again, the semiconductors down, right? NVIDIA is down 1.78. Intel down 26.06%. Huge drop. Um, the majority of the stocks uh, here dropped, except for MPWR. Let's see. Google was down. Meta. Amazon down 8.79. Tesla down 4.2. A lot of the financial stocks like JP Morgan were down. So the banks, okay. Uh, the credit services like Visa and MasterCard, not so much, probably because people are going to be utilizing those credit cards a lot more. And they will most likely benefit, right, from all those interest rates that they charge. They just love to charge in over, what, 19, 20%, which is kind of insane. Um, healthcare plans did well today. UNH was up 2.98. A lot of the consumer defensives like Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Colgate, um, you know, McDonald's did good. It was up 2.95%. Some of the real estate, the majority of the utilities did well, but the basic materials not so great. Energy was down quite a bit. Industrials were mostly down. Um, healthcare was mixed. So, yeah, not a good day. Let's look at the group. And let me go back here for a moment. Let's switch it to the one-week performance. Here we are. For the one for the week itself, you can see there's a little, slightly different picture. Meta was up 4.82. You can see here, again, the credit cards, Visa and MasterCard did pretty good. PayPal did pretty good too. It was up, uh, looks like over 6.33%. All the utility, you know, the majority of the utilities in the S&P 500 did well. Energy down, real estate up. Okay, Amazon had that big drop of 8% for the week. Anyway. And then um, here's the group screener. It shows the one-day performance. For today, the consumer defensive were the strongest. Consumer cyclical, financial technology, energy, industrials were all down the most today. The one-week performance, for the, you know, again, the strongest ones were in utilities, real estate, consumer defensive. And the weakest were technology, financial, consumer cyclical. And here's the one month down here, real estate, utilities, healthcare consumer defensive so with that said let's get into the charts now in this video i'm going to have to break this video down uh to two videos actually i'm going to do this first one and the reason i'm doing two videos to cover today's um stocks and etfs and everything is because it's just i have to cover both the weekly and the daily so it's going to take double the amount of time to do the analysis so in this particular video i'll be doing the indices I'll be doing the four stocks that were covered 
Okay, that the um, guests on the halftime report recommended, and I'll also cover uh, two of the members' requests, and then I'll do the let's see here, the sectors and ETFs, and then also the Fab Seven stocks in the next video. Okay, so let's get started here. Um, take a look. All of the all of these indice ETFs dropped today. The one that was down the least was the one that I recommended yesterday, the SPHD. It's still actually holding up above the Tengensen and the Kijensen. It was down just 0.10% today. So it's a very low volatile stock in this type of environment. This is if you're going to be invested and you want to be invested in the markets, this might make the most sense if you don't want to deal with all that volatility that's going on right now. You know, the VIX today was insane let me just show you that okay i have to i do have to show you what happened with the vix today because that was an absolutely out of control whoops let's see where is it here it is okay so look at this okay it was up 25.82 percent but at one point it was over 50 percent so from that level let's see from the prior day's close to that level uh 59.55 percent Wow, right? A 60% move where you can see here uh, on the weekly chart, we've actually broken above the cloud as well. Okay, that's not good. ADX moving up. But the positive thing is that during the end of the day, you'll notice that this, this very, very long wick, and that also kind of cars, you know, correlates to the action, right? Uh, in the markets uh, where some buying started happening after 11 a.m. holding the deterioration of the pricing going down further and you can see it here in the five minute with the VIX the volatility started to drop right look at that around 11:35 a.m. You, you see that pop up here 11:35 a.m. somewhere around there eight okay so um, we'll see if there will be a continuation next week but it's hard to tell what's gonna happen obviously so let's go back here. Let's take a look at the weekly charts. We're going to go through the weekly on all of these, and then we'll go into the dailies, all right? So that way we can keep it all in order. SPHD, as you can see. Now, the reason I cover the weekly is there there are a lot of traders out there that want to make their decisions just based on this specific time frame versus the daily. As you all know, the daily can be very, it can be up, down. You know, you're going to get a lot more, um, you know, buy signals and sell signals all right it's, it's a lot more it's a more active uh time frame the daily the weekly not so much right for the last four weeks now sphd has been doing good we got the buy signal back here for example on the weekly and uh since that point it has moved up about 4.34 percent so again it doesn't really move that much right in the last month this thing has only moved about as you can see four percent or so um Let's look at the SPY for uh, next on the weekly. This one is under the Tengensen this week. Very bearish. Uh, held up above a support level of 533. No, it did not. It closed under it. So it closed under the 533 level. It's at 532.90. So that's also bad. Um, ADX, you can see it's dropping. The negative DI line here is crossing. You know, it could be short-lived. This could be a short-lived. Here's here's an incident right here back on this date, April 19th. And then the very next week, you can see here that a lot of buying started happening. Uh, it's also come to a support level of the Kijensen. Uh But the volume here is a little bit alarming as it's increasing these last three weeks on the way down. All right, next, let's look at the Qs. Same situation, look at the volume, four weeks now in a row right we had that reversal candle right there and it dropped how about the dow on the weekly under the tengensen not good this is the first week where it's closing under the tengensen but it found support at kijensen so again the weekly would be more for people who don't who are just not that active in trading you might want to make decisions less often the last buy point was right here if you got in back here on June 21st, you made about 1.47%, which is not that much, but you could be exiting with a little bit of a profit. 
um, Russell 2000. We had the buy signal, last buy signal here. You'd be taking a little bit of a loss, 2% if you exit right now. That's on the weekly chart. RSP, okay, this one here we on the weekly chart, down 1.15% if you're using the weekly chart. Again, the Tenkinson, one of the rules of the Ichimoku indicator is to keep us out of trades when price gets under the Tenkinson. And the reason is because we don't know when, how long that decline is gonna, gonna last, really. Uh, we wanna hold positions the entire time while it's moving above the Tenkinson and exit appropriately, right? And then re-enter if necessary, you know, if we need to. Uh, here is an example with RSP where once price closed under the Tenkinson, it tried to come back through it, was unable to, and then it dropped approximately 9.25% in about two months. Okay, IJR is a small cap, 600 on the weekly. This also closed under Tenkinson today, down 3.41% today. CAF, this is the small cash, uh, small cash cows, 100 ETF held up above the cloud, which is interesting to me. That's very bullish in a sense um, on the weekly, but it did in fact close under Tenkinson and Kijinson. It's up to you folks to really make a decision on how what you wanna do here. Uh, basically, the Ichimoku indicator is giving us a sell signal, okay? RWJ, same thing, closed under Tenkinson today. All right, and this is Friday, and this is the end of the week. That's why I can cover these. Now let's look at the daily time frames, and those aren't those are gonna look a little worse in some cases, except for the SPHD. Now this is the daily time frame. You can see it's holding up above Tengensen. So this is the only ETF that's holding above the daily and the weekly. There's the weekly, there's the daily. Here's the spy on the daily. It's inside the cloud. We got the sell signal much earlier, right here for the spy back on what day was that again? July 17th, that's the famous day, right? When things start to decline. The Qs happen at the same time. It's under the cloud now, it's getting worse. ADX is moving up, volume is increasing. Um, the Dow developed a bullish candle, it's called a hammer, but it is a red candle, so I, I wouldn't trust it 100%. It also closed under this low. That's also very bearish for the Dow. Russell 2000. You know, yesterday, it was doing something positive. It was holding up above this level, the 215.38. Today, closed under. It gave us a little bit of uh, a bullish signal here, though. This doji. So, this could potentially be a reversal point, but there's no guarantees there. Let me show you what that looks like on the candlestick reference sheet. Okay, so here's the, the reference sheet here. It's called a doji. Now, it looks like a, a bearish spinning top after a move down. If you get one of these, you know, where the wick is equal on the, on the top as it is, you know, for, here's a small body, wick on the top, wick on the bottom. Uh, the doji is, um, it's not actually listed in this little group here. Oh, here we go, here's a doji star. So it just, it looks like a little cross and that's what we essentially have here. It's kind of like a spin top slash cross. It's a bullish one. It's possible that it could pop back right back above. All right, let's look at the two hour for a second. You see what happened here, it gapped down and then just remained in this little base for a little bit. Um, anyway, so that's where we are with the Russell 2000 on the daily. RSP under the Kijinson, right? Today, and it developed a hammer down 1.72. IJR under the Tenkinson, under the Kijinson, under our support level of 111.57. This is a negative, this is a red uh, spinning top. So the bullet, if it was if it was a blue one like you see here, that would be more bullish. It's not in this case. The CALF ETF finding support at the top of the cloud. A lot of times there will it will find support and it will bounce uh, after a drop. Hard to tell. Only Monday will know when if price starts getting under. Here's how you, you know, I always say like use the, the low of these candles to help. If, you, if you're trying to make a decision about something, you say see it popping back under in the morning. 
you know, you may want to consider exiting that position. Um, there may be a continuation at that point. If it gets above the high of that candle, okay, when you get a reversal candle, then it should continue to move back up. Or it's more likely to. It's a higher probability. RWJ, same situation here. So it's put us in a, in a place where there's a lot of indecision. And that's what that candle really um, signifies. There are neither enough buyers nor sellers here at, during this specific day um, based on the action for us to know exactly what to do. Here's the five minute. You can see it gapped down and it just stayed flat. So this means there's an equal amount of buying and selling taking place here. The, the sellers were not in control the rest of this, all this day. It was just the aftermarket and pre-market that brought it down to this level. All right, now let's do the CNBC stocks that were recommended. Let's look at McDonald's. Let's look at the weekly chart first. Now McDonald's was recommended by Rob, okay, the guy with the glasses. Um, it you know it was up 2.95 percent today. This is the weekly chart. It's obviously a, a bullish week for McDonald's, right? After the earnings announcement. Now the earnings announcement was not that great, but uh, they're changing things at McDonald's. They're you know coming out with those five dollar meals, and I think those are successful. Or there's a lot more um, positive you know, in the positive news in the press regarding McDonald's and it's it's doing better, but it has not broken through the cloud. We still have a bearish cloud, as you can see here, prices inside the cloud. I would not be entering a long position in this. And look at the daily time frame. On the daily time frame, it has broken through the cloud, more bullish. But again, if you don't have both of the time frames, the weekly and the daily confirming the, the bullish uh, move in the stock, you know, you may want to hold off uh, until you get that. Microsoft, let's look at the weekly chart. You know, this one, unfortunately, also continuing its way down. Higher volume down below. This was um, today, Microsoft was not Kevin. Was it, let's see, Microsoft was Jason's pick, okay? I wrote this the other day, so let me get rid of that. This was Jason's pick. And yeah, I mean, it's not at a place that I would be entering a long position. Look at the daily time frame. We're in a downtrend. So not the time to buy. You know, these guys have different um, strategies, you know, as far as entering long. And, you know, they, they try to pick bottoms and I don't. I, I, wait for the, I wait for the chart to tell me that this is, there's a reversal taking place, that there's some upper there's momentum to the upside we don't have that right now you know we're at a support level do you see this right here um let me just draw that right in there so it's found some support here maybe it'll get a bounce if we have a a more bullish week next week but again we're under the tenkinson we're under the kijinson those moving averages are very significant we're under the cloud we have a bearish cloud here on the daily stay out of microsoft nvidia same situation under the moving averages. We got our sell signal all the way back here when price closed under the Tankinson and Kijinson right there. And since then, it has dropped 15.8%. That's NVIDIA. All right, that, there it is. That was that July, that happened on July 11th. We have not had a buy signal. And that's what I'm talking about. It's hard to say, you know, someone might say, oh, maybe I should buy here. You know, price is finding some support at that 1701 level, that prior low. Notice how it was stalling, stalling, stalling. It looked like it was bouncing here. Now, most novice traders would take that trade. Okay, they would they would be like, oh, look, it's also breaking through that high. I think I'm going to take this. But look, that resistance is real. Tankinson, Kijinson, that's real resistance right there. There's the Kijinson right there holding it back. Okay, multiple times. Here it looked bullish too, right? Remember everyone got excited about this day during the week on, on Wednesday, July 31st? Popped back into the cloud. It was looking really good. In fact, it happened on after a gap up. But I knew, and I, and I mentioned it on Wednesday. Guys, don't get, don't get too excited about this. And the next day, we had that day, and then it dropped. Now, um, 
it did gap down but notice it is you know all of these sometimes show some support some levels of support give some hope that there might be a reversal but that's all that is is hope and um, i would not trust it at this point how about rig rig this this one was and by the way nvidia was uh whose was that that was brin's recommendation and 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 then uh, rig was jim jim leventhal's farmer jim okay he's he's recommended this one before too it's kind of funny um this one has a negative profit margin negative sales growth down 4.76 percent technically one of the most unsound out of the bunch here obviously and so i would strongly recommend against buying this stock look at this we have a bearish candle price has just closed you know this week back under tankins and keegenson and uh of course you know these guys aren't looking at the stuff and you know they, they think that they're buying they're they're gonna just keep buying it as it drops down and let's hope that they don't get hurt too hard too much there all right let's look at member the members request now that's the daily time frame by the way where it gapped down even further okay ryceef this was a um this one i wanted to bring up something that i haven't talked about ever before really and that's about stocks that trade on pink sheet. they're basically pink sheet stocks all right they don't trade on the not new york stock exchange or nasdaq um okay this is they're generally considered a highly speculative and, and carry a significant higher risk of loss compared to the stocks listed on major exchanges there's a lack of information many pink sheet companies provide limited financial information making it challenging to assess their value and performance low liquidity okay uh, look at this 58,200 uh, trades right there trading volume is often low making it difficult to buy or sell shares quickly without impacting the price there's also fraud risk uh, pink sheet market has a history you know, I just I just took this from uh, the web, but basically, yeah, this is Rolls Royce G R Port P O R D. Um, notice how there's no fundamentals, right? So we're we're basically trading blind as far as fundamentals go here. But the technicals, if we're talking about just technicals, right? And that's one of the things I do. Do look good. This has done quite well. Um, since 2020 mid 2023 it looks like we had a buy signal back on february 24th 2023 you can see here the majority of time all right there was a few moments where it got under it never actually got under the kijensen so the kijensen folks that's a very strong level that think of this as a this is this is not a bad place to put hard stops you know under the kijensen because it's a little bit slower than the tankinson um but yeah i mean since that point we're talking about let's measure that it has moved approximately 265 percent in 1.4 years but again you just saw the warning that i gave you guys about our ycef so rolls royce and that's the weekly this is the daily you can see it's a little bit more volatile all over the place hard harder to trade on the daily time frame because you're going to get a lot of buy sell signals uh it's it's gonna be and you can see how the candles see how they got there's a lot of gaps taking place here that's due to the lack of volume you generally want to trade stocks that have um a volume of at least over five hundred thousands, you know shares sometimes you know I'll, I'll look at other ones that are like 400 or 300 but you know especially if it's a high priced stock um i'll look at it but um you know this is um you know look at this the price here is um five dollars and 95 cents so I'd, I'd be careful all right i wouldn't i would not be um holding a position like this myself personally all right here's another one from our members spotify technology on the weekly chart uh it is holding up above tankinson above the kijinson above the cloud looks bullish it did develop um due to the action this week it did develop a reversal candle here a shooting star and that looks a little bit like this candle right here after a move up you get that long wick small red body 
By the way, if you guys want to access this candle powder reference sheet for your, um, you know, put it and download it or save it. If you go to my, let's, let me show you how to do that. Go to the Blue Cloud Trading homepage, click on four more links, scroll down to my Twitter link. And if you scroll through the posts, if you keep going down, you'll eventually find it. It's in there and you can download it from there. Um, there's also some other stuff there too, but, and since I'm here real quick, um, one of the things I'll be doing this weekend is going over, you know, the portfolio of stocks that I add and also subtract from uh, the members only videos, right? And those are the stocks that pop up on my weekly scanner that have the strongest technicals on the weekly and daily charts at the time that I'm picking them. Uh, and there's over 20 stocks that were covered, for example, in this video, and it'll be about the same in the next one. So you may want to look into that if you're looking for some ideas of where to be investing. I go in a little bit more in depth on entry and exit, okay, and how to identify those um, those position, you know, when it's appropriate to be doing it, and just a little bit more on the strategy that I use, um, and then also. Yeah, just this, these vi these specific ones are only available under the Blue Cloud Trader level. So to get to that, to become a Blue Cloud Trader level uh, member, you have to click on the Join button. All right, click on Join. Select Blue Cloud Trader. Not Blue Cloud Supporter, but Blue Cloud Trader. It is $24.99 a month. Um, and it's, uh, like I said, exclusive member-only videos. You can also, re you know, once you become a member... You know, you notice that I sometimes pick some of the stocks from our members to, to analyze on the show. That's one of the things that you can do under actually all three of these uh, levels. You can do that under Blue Cloud Supporter, Blue Cloud Trader, or Blue Cloud Legend. This level here is more about like I've, I'm uh, starting to do like day trading videos and I'll be uploading those. So that is for those of you who are into day trading, okay? The Blue Cloud Trader is more for swing traders and um so yeah okay now let's see let's get back to our charts spotify technology spot so on the weekly looks good okay all the fundamentals look good next earnings are on october 22nd so you don't have to worry about any you know uh, potential you know jumps in price uh, due to earnings and uh, due to an earnings announcement on the daily chart see Thursday this was um, Thursday August 1st we created a, a shooting star it it did pop make the, the price drop down 1.68 percent it then immediately created a bullish candle like a hammer and it but it's and it's above the Kijinson so you know it's up to you to decide now personally what would I be doing in this situation I probably would actually hold this uh, only because it's finding support right there and because it has a Kijinson for support. If it closes under Kijinson though, you may want to exit that trade. Um, I'd probably want to see how it responds to the high and low of that candle, the bullish candle. That's just me, that's one of the my strategies. Um, okay guys, that's gonna do it for this particular video. Remember, I'm gonna be covering in the next video, um, the Fab 8. Fab 7, I'm sorry, and the sectors and ETFs, which go over, and by the way, I'll be covering something called TLT in this one, in the next video, 20-year treasury up 3.12%, so stay tuned for that. A quick announcement, I just wanted to let you know that we have achieved over 10,000 subscribers recently on this channel, and want to thank each and every one of you that has uh, subscribed, really appreciate you all, and uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, Think about it, it doesn't cost anything, it's free. Just hit that subscribe button. There's a like button down below, you know, you can hit that too. If you wanna go one step further to support this channel, you can actually join and become a member. You just click on this join button here, and there are three levels. There's a Blue Cloud Supporter, Blue Cloud Trader, and Blue Cloud Legend level. If you want to see additional exclusive member-only videos, you become a Blue Cloud Trader at this level, you will also access these member videos. Let me show you what they look like. You'll find them if you scroll down on my page here. You'll find them all here.
I share the stock scanner results that signal the new Ichimoku buy signals at the end of the week from my proprietary scanner. I then further identify the ones that are the strongest within the strongest sector and industry group that also have good fundamentals. If you want to take it to the next level and become a Blue Cloud Legend member, you will be able to access. In addition to those member videos that we just talked about, okay, you'll be able to request up to four stocks per week to be analyzed on the show. And you can also view videos that are not available under this section where I go into day trading. One more thing I should mention, if you guys like the software that I use, TC2000, you can access that software. Do the following. Click here, again, at four more links. Click at T on TC2000 affiliate link. It will bring you to this page. You type your email here. If you have a Windows machine, you can download the TC2000 for Windows. If it's a Mac, right here. What you'll see below here is that you will receive a $25 coupon towards your TC2000 service, courtesy of Blue Cloud Trading. The only thing is you must have not used this TC2000 service in the last 12 months to get that $25 coupon. Here is the pricing section. Click on that. Select software plans and data so you can get an idea of how much it costs. You can get as low as $22.49 a month for the gold if you do the biannual. But if you do the billing cycle as monthly per month, it's $29.99. I strongly recommend that you go with gold versus silver or platinum when you're first starting out, just so that you can actually get an understanding of how to use the software if you're starting out for the first time. Okay, you're gonna get a lot more features under the gold. Okay, you'll be able to, for example, use an easy scan condition library. So you can scan through stocks based on the criteria that you want. Filter and sort watch list columns. You can see all the different things that you'll be able to access here, including being able to create alerts on your trades. You know, you can also get the fundamentals. Now, once you have downloaded the software, if you want to make your charts look similar to the ones that I have on the channel with the Ichimoku indicator and everything else, what one of the things you can do is click on this section here, playlists, and go into educational videos you'll find this video, TC2000 Tutorial 2024 by Blue Cloud Trading. And in this video, I show you guys exactly how to add all those features. All right, thanks guys, and I will catch you all in the next video.